Welcome to Omron's Automating Life Sciences Tech Talk series. In this series, we cover four topics that are at the forefront of changing the way life sciences operate today and beyond. In this Tech Talk, Omron's Director of Traceability Solutions, John Agapakis, and Life Sciences Strategic Account Manager, Jason Mack, team up for part two on traceability. They will discuss in greater detail offline and inline verification for both labeling and direct part marking, as well as the newest marking and printing technologies and relevant guidelines. As we discussed in part one of this webinar, any traceability implementation needs to be viewed as a sequence of four steps. First, you need to select the right marking or printing process and the process parameters most appropriate for the application. Next, you need to use a special purpose tools, verifiers, that can be used both to select the starting marking process parameters for the best initial mark quality or print quality, and as well as inline verifiers to make sure that you consistently maintain the same high print or mark quality. Along the production line, you need to then make sure that you have selected the most appropriate reader configurations to collect the data and ultimately this data need to be communicated to the data management systems that collect all the traceability information. Printing a label or marking a 2D code directly on a part is always the first step in any traceability implementation. Looking now at uh, common label printing and direct part marking methods that are used in life science applications. And starting with label printing, we can see that the most common technique used in these applications is thermal transfer printing. Thermal transfer printing is a digital printing method in which material is applied to paper or some other material by melting a coating of ribbon so that it stays glued to the material on which the print is applied. This is in contrast to direct thermal printing, where no ribbon is present in the process. If the label is to be placed on a package, then sometimes a, a thermal transfer printing engine is combined with a label applicator. In direct part marking, there are typically three most commonly used techniques, laser marking, dot pinning, and inkjet marking, but out of those, Laser marking is the most common technique used in life science applications today. As you can see in this slide, we can use laser marking to make very, very small marks and therefore mark a very small medical devices or electronic parts. We can also use laser marking in marking very delicate materials. Diving into the details of laser marking technology are obviously outside the scope of this webinar. However, it would be appropriate to mention that in uh, modern laser marking systems used in life science applications typically are based on fiber laser technology that can ensure high beam quality, stability, and long life. Options allowing marking of a variety of materials and in a variety of 3D surface geometries, cones, cylinders, spheres, and so on, are obviously very important medical device uh, marking applications. Operating modes, that ensure high speed and high accuracy marking and both fine detail and deep marking options and allow high contrast marking at high speeds are again, uh, obviously very valuable. Finally, the ability to combine and built in machine vision capabilities that allow part positioning compensation without requiring an external part positioning system marking process monitoring, and final mark quality inspection are also extremely useful. Since data matrix codes are probably the most commonly specified and used 2D codes in um, both life sciences and other industrial direct part marking standards and applications, we consider it appropriate to include here some guidelines for code sizing and uh, corresponding reader camera resolution selection. As you can see in the data matrix code specification, data matrix codes can encode up to 2,335 alphanumeric characters or up to 3,116 numeric digits. 
data matrix codes are scalable and can be printed or marked at different densities. And you can see this very clearly in this uh, snippet of a data capacity chart that shows data matrix codes with sizes between 10 by 10 and 44 by 44 rows and columns and corresponding data capacities between 6 and 288 numeric digits or between 3 and 214 alphanumeric characters. As you can also see in the same chart, the same data matrix codes can be printed or marked in different sizes depending on the resolution or the density of the uh, printing or marking process. In general, you want to make the data matrix code as big as practical and try to select the code size and a corresponding reader or camera resolution that yields approximately three pixels per cell. For best robustness, you could uh, even go to five pixels per cell if practical. In general, industrial readers typically are resolutions of uh, 1.3 megapixels, but readers with uh, up to five megapixels resolutions are available. If you need to go much higher in terms of resolution, then it's typically appropriate to go to a smart camera or a general machine vision system with cameras with much higher resolutions. Another data matrix marking or printing guideline worth sharing here refers to the marking of a data matrix code directly on a cylindrical medical device or uh, affixing a label on the side of a bottle used in pharmaceutical packaging or on the side of a uh, cylindrical clinical specimen uh, tube used in clinical diagnostics instrumentation. In all of those cases, for best results, one should uh, choose a size of a data matrix that is less than a sixth of the diameter of the cylinder. If it is not possible to do that and one needs to put more information that uh, can be um, accommodated by the size, you can also um, use, instead of the square data matrix codes that we've seen up to now, also rectangular data matrix codes that are allowed in the data matrix standard. Looking now at uh, mark uh, and print quality and starting with direct mark marking, we can see that depending on the process used, marking process used, different uh, problems can crop up. A very common one is that of overprinting or underprinting where you have inconsistent or improper mark cell size. Uh, in some processes, you may have improper placement and wandering around of the location of the individual cells. Some other cases, you may have a distortion of the overall mark geometry, problems or damage on the mark or part surface, or inconsistent contrast across the mark. Similarly, in the case of label printing, a lot can go wrong in processes such as thermal transfer printing. For example, wrinkles in the ribbon, mismatching between the ribbon and the label substrate, defective areas in the label substrate, over or under heating of the printing head, which may result in over or under printing, variability because of changes in label stock material from one day to the next, foreign matter on uh, the labels, problems with uh, burned out pixels, misalignment in the print heads, and so on. All of those problems in either marking or printing can uh, result in problems with lost or misinterpreted information, increased labor costs, relabeling costs, increased errors, product recalls, rejected shipments, user dissatisfaction, and of course, especially important in life science applications, compliance penalties. You often hear the question, why can I just use a barcode reader to check that the code is readable? You may indeed be able to do that, but uh, you may be just a scratch away from the code being unreadable. So verification is an objective method, a objective, precise, standardized measurement of the quality of the barcode against the published specification, which allows you not only to tell that the code is readable, but how close you are to the edge of readability. As such, is a predictor of how well the code will be able to be read throughout its life. 
you can use verification either offline during the initial setup of your marketing process to make sure that you have the best mark quality to start with and then in line during the process during production to maintain consistently high mark quality during the inline verification you essentially monitor the quality of the code and if you detect that the quality of the code becomes comes below a set threshold then you can initiate some preventative maintenance you can stop the process or you could even switch in a secondary marking method or uh, process so that you can continue production while you're dealing with the marking problem in your primary marker another question that you may often hear is what's the difference between verification and validation verification is determining the quality of the printing or marking to predict readability it is really checking the code quality against an iso standard to ensure that the code can be read by any reader it requires a precision test instrument a calibrated instrument a metro calibrated metrology instrument the verifier that is certified to conform to the specific iso standard in addition to a grading report it will also often produce diagnostics which allow the user to troubleshoot the printing or the marking process validation on the other hand is really checking the content of the code not the quality of the printing it can check that the code can be read now by the particular reader and confirms that the decoded data output is what was expected or required by a specification such as for example the gs1 specification for the fda udi mandate validation does not provide a reference point on whether another reader may be able to read the code and definitely does not produce an iso grade as a verifier would the applicable international print mark quality standards that are referenced by the various industry standards and specs include iso 15416 for 1d codes ISO 15415 for printed 2D codes and ISO TR29158, previously known as AIM DPM, for direct part marks. All these verification standards include detailed definitions for various measurements that allow you to detect the occurrence of any of the marking problems or printing problems that we highlighted earlier. So, specifically, the ISO 15415. Uh, standards for printed 2D codes include measurements for symbol contrast, axial non-uniformity, grid non-uniformity, modulation, fixed pattern damage, unused error correction, and print growth. One point of note here is that for verification, you need more pixels per cell than what is required for just reading. Typically, you need three pixels per cell for per element for um, reading but 8 to 10 pixels per cell for effective verification as we briefly highlighted in part one of this webinar the fda unique device id udi ruling specifically requires checking of the barcode content format and quality uh, for any uh, UDI labeling or direct part marking application. It actually uh, expects that you will follow the issuing agency's rules and guidelines for data content, data format, and print or mark quality. And the issuing agencies themselves point you to an ISO standard, the applicable ISO standard for print or mark quality, and typically requires a numerical grade on 1.5 or better in the specific case of gs1 the guidelines specifically state an unreadable barcode is the same as a missing barcode which would mean non-compliance let me now pass it over to jason mack who will walk us through some actual examples of offline and inline label verification applications in life sciences Thanks, John, for the introduction. As you can see here, we have two typical GS1 codes. 
we have taken a once over inspection and see that they look good and also confirm that they're readable with one of our barcode readers. But as we know from before, this is not enough to become compliant. When we run these codes through our offline verifier, we can see that they're indeed failing. This is due to a problem with modulation. Next, we can dig a little deeper and see what is actually causing this problem in the print process. My first step to determining what is causing the modulation issue is to zoom in on the codes. With a four times magnification on both the 1 and 2D codes, we can see there is a significant overprint issue. On the code on the left, you can see that we're almost ready to completely lose the spaces. And on the code on the right, the clock pulse, each of the elements should be the same size and you can see the darker marks are much larger than the white spaces. Finally, we can use the analytical tools built into the software to better understand the issue at hand. On the left, you can see the peaks of each of the spaces do not line up and therefore making it difficult for the software to analyze the waveform. And on the right hand side, you can see the black ink is actually outside of each of the elements giving us the smaller white spaces in between and again making it harder for the software to analyze the code. Now that we know how to fix our code's print quality, we can look at the other important part, which is the syntax check. Here we have two seemingly identical codes. We can tell based on our previous experience that these look like they are printed correctly, but why is one of them failing? Again, using our verifier, we can grade the codes and check both the print quality and the structure of the code. The first code seems to pass without issue. The second code, however, is failing. As you see on the right hand side, the code looks to have good print quality, but on the bottom we can see we have a warning, the symbol error, so we must look at the structure tab for more information. On the structure tab, we can see the error is an invalid date. As you know, November only has 30 days and therefore a date of 1131 is invalid. On the other side, you can see December has 31 days and therefore it is a passing code. We can also see all of the information that GS1 includes in the barcode broken out, both with their numerical value and the text associated with that. Now that we are experts on label grading, we can move on to direct part mark verification. Unlike with the labels where we have black ink on a white label, which gives us a very uniform substrate, here we are printing directly onto parts, often metal, sometimes with different finishes, which makes it a little bit tougher to both read and grade. One of the most important things with this type of verification is the lighting. As you can see on the right hand side, something like this handheld verifier provides multiple angles and types of light to get the best read and grade on the part. You can see a number of different lighting styles make the barcode look very different. This is a curved mark with a slightly indented surface. If we try to hit it with 90 degree lighting, you start to see some of the light fall off the sides. With the other angled lighting, we have the same issue where it's tough to light up the code. It isn't until we provide a dome light with even illumination from multiple angles that the code looks and performs extremely well. While offline verification is very powerful, it can become very tedious to try to grade hundreds, if not thousands of labels using a system that can only go one by one. Here you can see an inline system that can grade labels as they're being printed directly out of the printer using a camera and a set of software. Once you go to a system like this, it's not only going to be able to do label verification for the barcodes, grading at the same ISO standards as the offline verifiers, but we'll also be able to do optical character recognition, optical character verification, 
where we can make sure that any of the important data that's printed on the label is printed properly, as well as a master label comparison or a blemish detector, which will allow us to analyze any of the static data on the label with ease. Much like a vision system, we must start by setting up each of our tools for the given areas. Automatically, the system is able to find all of the barcodes and label those sectors two, three, and four, as well as a blemish that goes around one entire label. We've also added an OCR sector as sector five for analysis. Here, we are defining what information we'd like to look at within the 1D barcode. As you can see, it shows all of the passing parameters that we looked at before with the offline verifier. We can continue to go one by one through each of the sectors that you see on the bottom label laid out. Here, we are looking at the 2D code, and you'll notice that these are all the same parameters that we were getting in the offline verifier. Here is the OCR or OCV tool. In the upper right, you can see we are drawing a box around the set of numbers that are serialized on these labels. We must select a font, and then we can compare that font to the current numbers shown. As you can see, a 0, 2, and 4 are going to be our best matches, but we can also try to see a comparison of other letters and numbers like 6IA or 8ZW, with the idea trying to give the largest separation between the character you're seeing and the character uh, it's being compared to. Also, you can look in the left and we can define which direction the text is facing just by a simple uh, selection there. Finally, we will set up the blemish tool or the golden image comparison tool. Here, we're able to compare all of the static text on the label with a simple comparison to a golden label. One thing we got to make sure to do is to use or ignore any of the variable data, such as the serial number that we looked at on the previous slide in section five. The system remembers every single error that has occurred and logs it based both on the distance along the roll and which label it's seen. So you can see here on the left hand side under repeat, which label number we had the error on. Each time we had an error, the system would stop and we could make a decision whether to replace or accept that error. That information is then logged based on the user to make sure that you have complete traceability for CFR 21 part 11 compliance. Here you can see an example of the blemish tool finding an error with a little bit of extra ink printed on the V. This may be something that you decide to error out and remove the label, or this could be something you allow the operator to make a decision to keep. As you can see, it shows the two images toggling back and forth between the golden image and the actual, so it's easy for the operator to tell where the issue is. This is the same type of error, but here we are missing ink instead of having extra ink. These are the kind of decisions you would want to determine how the operator is meant to handle this ahead of time, but knowing full well that everything that the operator does will be saved in the log to be reviewed at the end. Once we are done with this batch of labels, we can review the log report and the summary report. In the log, you will see every action made during the run and be able to review any of the specific errors you found on the labels. With the summary report, you will get a count of each of the errors you encountered. As you can see, it will show you how many good labels and bad labels were produced. This is a great way to give a total count for a batch printing of a specific set of labels. The final type of verification setup is a smart camera based system. Here you can use any number of high performance smart cameras, but it is on the user to create the appropriate lighting setup. This is very powerful because it allows you to fit a system that will mount in line and allows you to do very specific label or direct part mark grading, all at high production speeds and tailored to your specific application. 
With a better understanding of all of these tools at our disposal, we can start to look at a full system approach to printing quality labels. It must begin with an operator creating the labels and using a verifier to confirm that the structure is properly configured. Second, we would begin to set up our printer and use an offline verifier to make sure all of the printer settings are creating good labels. Finally, we would configure our inline system to make sure that all of our labels being printed pass the quality checks. Next, we can go back to John to take a better look at how we will use these codes within our manufacturing environment. Just as in the case of verifiers, barcode readers also come in a variety of configurations that may be appropriate in different situations. The most common such configuration is that of a fixed mount imager, that is a compact camera base reader that can be used to read both 1D and 2D codes, either on labels or directly marked on parts. These units can be configured either as embedded OEM units that can be integrated, say, inside the clinical instrument, or as industrial readers that can be integrated in a machine or deployed along a production line. These imagers can also be configured as handheld units that may be appropriate in cases where a human operator is in the loop, such as, for example, in a repair station or when the part that needs to be read is too big to be brought under a fixed mount reader. In some cases, it may be even appropriate, instead of using a fixed mount imager reader uh, that can only perform one operation, barcode reading, to instead use a fully featured smart camera that can perform other vision inspections in addition to barcode reading. It may even be appropriate to use a full vision system with multiple cameras connected to a single processing unit. This may be necessary when you need to perform additional vision inspections in a particular location or when the combination of the code size and the field of view are such that dictate camera resolutions higher than what is typically found in a, a fixed mount imager, say over five megapixels. Finally, it may still be appropriate in some cases to use conventional laser scanners. Even though these units can only read 1D codes, it may still be appropriate to deploy them and use them either because of price performance considerations because of uh, uh, scanning range and depth of focus or ease of operation. The specifics of the application may also dictate special optics or lighting options for an imager. In this example, we're showing a standard imager just fitted with ultra high density optics that allows us to read extremely small and very high density codes directly marked on a medical device or a very small electronic component. In the image, we're actually demonstrating reading a code with a critical with a cell size of two thousandths of an inch. In this example, again, we're using a standard imager, just using long range optics that allows it to read UPC codes, 13 mil UPC codes out at three and a half feet. In both cases, uh, the imagers can be either fixed focus or autofocus using uh, liquid lens optics. Yet another example where we very accurately synchronize the illumination, the strobed illumination, and the acquisition by the camera to allow us to read extremely fast moving codes at 330 inches per second. Finally, this is an example of reading covert codes, codes that are printed with a special ink that is normally invisible under normal illumination, but fluoresce and become visible under IR or UV lighting. The range of applications that were highlighted in the previous slide become possible by leveraging a modular imager architecture that combines alternative optics configurations, either fixed or autofocus, with a range of image sensor configurations at different resolutions.
together with additional lighting options and filtering options, the units can further be configured as an industrial or as an embedded OEM unit through different connectivity and enclosure hardening configurations. The, Im these images can be delivered either as label readers or direct part mark readers appropriate for more challenging direct part marks by uh, loading the appropriate firmware. Since, of course, uh, an imager is nothing more than a miniature smart camera, the same unit can also be rebooted with different firmware and be a fully functioning smart camera for machine vision applications. Speaking of machine vision, and as we mentioned earlier, it is not uncommon in many life science uh, settings to need to combine both barcode reading with other machine vision inspections. Those types of applications we typically refer to as Auto ID Plus applications. And case in point here, in pharma or medical device label inspection, one may need to both read the data matrix code in the label and at the same time use optical character recognition to read some corresponding human readable text string and then com compare the two. At the same, similarly, you may want to check the quality of printing of the code, the 2D code here, using uh, ISO standards, and at the same time, check the legibility of the human readable text using optical character verification. Another example in clinical diagnostics instrumentation, you may want to use the imager not only to read the barcode on the specimen tube, but also uh, check its size, whether or not it's an adult or pediatric tube, and or check the presence or absence of the cap or even the color of the cap. Uh, in a lab automation system, in a robotic liquid handling system, you may need to use an imager not only to read the code on certain consumables, but also use it as a smart camera and check the presence or absence or correct placement of the consumables on the bed of the, um, of the liquid handling system. And finally, in many uh, life science uh, instrumentation applications, uh, you may find an opportunity to replace a barcode reader uh, and multiple sensors that are used for different other presence absence checks with a single miniature smart camera that can combine all of the, those functions in a single package. In this final step, in the MVRC process, we need to enable connectivity and communication with markers, printers, barcode readers, vision systems, programmable logic controllers on the line, robots, other processing equipment, as well as databases and ERP systems. Overall, the traceability software needs to be able to record the part ID when the part is born when it's marked, record marking process data, confirm and record mark quality data that may be acquired during inline DPM verification. If mark quality is acceptable, allow the part to move on to the next process step. And during each process, subsequent process step, error proof um, the process by making sure that the correct part or combination of parts come together in that step and check that no processing step that may have been required earlier uh, has been skipped. Throughout the process, record the time where each part and each assembly enter each processing cell on each processing line and record relevant processing data for each one of those steps, as well as possibly record even images uh, at each process step. All of this information needs to be saved as data in the database and communicated with other uh, software systems. So to close, I wanted to uh, leave you with a thought that uh, we're here to support you uh, throughout your traceability implementation journey. Uh, we're here to support you if you are just starting with a traceability system because you're faced with a regulatory mandate or a customer request. We're also here to support you if you need to perfect the implementation of your traceability system 
leveraging our MVRC deployment methodology. And we're also here to support you as you're getting on your way uh, towards a traceability 4.0 implementation, leveraging process data in addition to part ID to optimize your processes. And that wraps our second tech talk on traceability. We invite you to listen on demand to the other three tech talks in our automating life sciences series.